What is the subject? Sir, if you remember, three days ago, we had started discussing the ground of the mind from which a new mind can flower. And while discussing it, you had spoken of, you had said that from the ground that is, which is conflict, fear, anger, the new can never emerge, and that something entirely new is necessary. You also spoke about the senses operating at their highest simultaneously. I want to start with a question. I am a newcomer. I hear this. Where do I begin? Probably first you will make head or tail of it. You will know what, you will see what the Dickens is you talking about. So, one has to more or less establish the, the linguistic and semantic meaning. So we must begin, I think, by being aware what relationship our senses have to nature. I will begin with that. How you look at nature, how you look at those rocks, which are these hills are supposed to be one of the most ancient hills in the world. How you look at all the boulders, the trees, the dry rivers, streams, and those poor village people walking 12 miles a day to a school, not enough food and so on and so on. Why there are no wild animals here at all? I'm going to all that. <coughs> because if we lose touch with nature, of which we are a part, then we lose touch with humanity, with our fellow beings. I will begin there. And I'll find out what my relationship is, how I look at nature, the trees, the flowers, the rocks, the rivers, the snow-capped mountains and so on. What relationship have I to all that? And the beauty of all that. Then you would inquire what is beauty. Then it gets complex. No, sir. That means you are saying that the starting point is in the outer, as we call it. Absolutely. If I don't have uh, the obvious common sense criteria, then how can I have clear perception of myself. You understand? I understand. Because the, the outward is, is a manifestation of myself. I'm part of nature. No. Without, without understanding the beauty of the land, the rivers and all the extraordinary world we live in, and the brutal world we live in, the 
cruel, the terrorist, all that. What's my relationship to all that? Am I blind to it all? Am I silent to it all? Or I have certain conclusions and those conclusions dominate and therefore it is a product of thought and nature is not a product of thought and so on. So we all think that we look at nature, we all think that we look at the tree, that we look at the flower, that we look at the rock, we all think that we look, we all feel that we look, we have eyes and so we look. But there is something in the looking you are talking about, in the relationship we are t you are talking about, which obviously is not the looking which we are used to. No, how do you look at it? Do you look at it only with your eyes? Is the perception of the shadows, long evening shadows, and the midday sun with his very, very sh small shadows. How do you look at all this? Only with your eyes or with your whole being, as with all your senses? How do you look at it, all this? How do you perceive all this, as though it was something outside you and you're looking at it, or you're part of all that. I know, theoretically we say we are part of it. No, I think one can actually say that there is a looking in which The seer does not exist. I'm saying it with the yes, but, that, but, then, but I don't want to start there. Yeah, I know that's why. That's I'm why I'm not. I'm I'm coming to you as a beginner, and I will tell you that uh, I look with my eyes. I want to start from that yeah. point. Do but you only look? I would reply to that. Do you only look with your eyes, or you hear the sound also? The sound of the trees, the breeze, listen to the flow, running waters, this whisper among the deep shadows of a tree. Do you listen, see, and but feel? It's like each. If you, if you are. seeing, listening, feeling, then there is the, no listening, seeing, feeling. There is just a state where everything mm -hmm. exists. But I, I don't know how to approach this problem, because I would like to approach it from the point of view of a beginning rather than any other. Would you agree human beings, even the most uneducated, have lost touch with nature? Yes, completely. Because when they see, their eyes move over. Yeah. They never look directly. Yes. They never look. It's a, they consider it too trivial. That just it. That just the whole point. They consider nature as something to be used, trivial, and it can be exploited. You see, sir, the mind has divided. Looking at a leaf or a leaf move is something unimportant. Yes. The important is something vast. So, so let's begin. What is important? For the average man, for ordinary person, what is important? Food, clothes, shelter, 
That's all what he's got. No, sir. Beyond that, the sacred, divine I, I, of God. Of course, of course. I'm just saying, beginning with that, he needs food, clothes, shelter. When he has that, then he begins to think about God, something external. Yes, and he, he wants to think of it in a vastness. Yes. He sees the evening sky and the sun rising and see the immensity of this, of this marvellous world. And he said, who created the world? Yes. So, uh, right? the, the capacity to, to see that the small and that vast are not of, at the same level of importance. Yes. There is no vast and small. Now we'll go into it. Coming back, would you not say that very often my looking is circumscribed by my thoughts? My, my senses. Louder, sir. Can't hear. My senses have been very deeply dominated by my thinking. I see within myself when I go for a walk that. I'm not really looking, I'm not really listening, it's, I'm all the time thinking. And from the thinking I occasionally glance at something or the other. So in a sense there is no looking or <coughs> seeing of the actuality of the tree or the leaf. You know, you try to get someone to look at one leaf and you'll find how difficult it is. Mm. Do, it your, do it oneself, and do, if one does it oneself, one realizes how difficult it is to l just look at a thing totally. As you said, we glance and move away. Move away. Sir, would you blame religions The Orthodox established religions have prevented man from considering nature as part of himself. Would you say religions have said, suppress all your senses? Yes. Don't look out there. Always look inside you. Krishnaji, would you not say that the modern urban man is not in any sense, in, not to a great extent, influenced by the religions at all? No, he is not. Yes. But I am talking, the, we, as he said from the beginning, an ordinary man. Not necessarily an <coughs> urban man, a citizen living in a big town. In the ordinary man in a little village or a little town, he has seen the sannyasis, the monks, the trappists who never speak. And they, they have always said, suppress desire, suppress senses. Because they distract. Not only religion, society with its religion. Of course, of course, of course. So there is the beginning of it. They don't say to you, look at all the wonders of this world. Right? You feel it, absorb it, be of it. But they have created images made by the hand or by the mind, and that is most important than, than anything else. You have this temple near here, Tirupati. Thousands go there, millions of money are spent on such imaginative God. So I, if I was an ordinary man, and I hear all this, and as Bhupati has pointed out, 
where do I begin? But wouldn't you say, Krishnaji, to even ask that question, the ordinary man must have seen somewhere that his world is limited. Yes. He knows death very well. So he has to be already a little bit discontented with his God, with his... I family. question, sir. I question whether he is discontented or skeptical about his gods. Then what makes him ask the question, where do I... He does not ask this question. Yes. He does, okay. sir. He does. Ah, it when he is in sorrow. Sorry. He does when there is suffering. Suffering. He does when there is death. When there is death. He does when you see a rich man go by in a marvelous car, and he is. Coming. And you walk ten miles to go to that village, then you begin to say, "What? What is all this? Why should I not be as rich as that man?" But that's not asking the same question. Yes, it is. It, it, Part of that question. Otherwise, how does one start? I know, that's why. Uh, At death. Death is a. My wife quarrels with me. Sir, so discussing with someone today in the morning, how is it that there are, there are a number of people who have themselves experienced no. They have lived very happy lives. They have no sorrow which is so obvious to most people, and they come upon these questions, and they go seriously into these questions. Oh yes, sir, but that is, we are talking of those people who are exceptional then. And to, we, we began by asking, if I was an ordinary man, fairly educated, so-called educated, quotes, where would I begin? to understand the very complex problem of existence, all the activities of thought, suffering, pain, anxiety, and all that. Where would I begin to understand the very complex society in which I live? That is a real question, should be missed. Jack, I began with. You see, we take it that listening to Krishnaji, the beginning must start within. We all take it that way. We've all taken it that way. So the beginning has to start within. As we have said through these years, discovery of what one is. We have never looked at the outside and seen the outside the same as, moment. as the same moment. Therefore the callousness, therefore the uh, lack of... Right, right. Why, do, why have we neglected or discarded or despised all the things around us, nature. But it means nothing to us. No, because we divide Krishnaji. The outer world is the world of uh, ma of uh, <coughs> yeah. desire, and we, the inner world is the, and the world of. Yes. The outer world is desire. Yes. And also, according to the Buddhists and many of the Hindu religions, the outside world is Maya, in illusion. It's, it's, it's Maya. It doesn't matter. And we are saying quite the contrary. And therefore, they, he says, I can't understand it. That's why. It, I feel it's important to understand one's relationship to nature, to the outward world, to the world in which all the misery, confusion, bribery and corruption are going on. I will look at that first, and then from the outer move to the inner. 
not start with the inner, because you have no ma- you have no judgment then you can't see clearly. And I think this is partly responsible for religious establishment. Worship God, follow Jesus or some other deity, and that's all. That's what is called religion. Their rituals, all their paraphernalia, that's called religion. So I'm, I personally I feel one feels one must start with things that we see, hear, feel outside. How I look at my wife, my children, my parents and all the rest of them, which are outside. And I see somebody carrying a dead body. In India it's very simple, not like in Europe with hearse and you know all the I see here in this country two or three people carrying a dead body. And there is there outside of me. But I begin to say what is there? Well and I begin to inquire. I can't just go off by myself into a mountain, a cave, and say, what is death? I can imagine all kinds of things, or what is God, or what is... But if I have not established right relationship with nature, with my... with another person, whether wife, husband, or whatever it is, or my friends, if you haven't established right relationship there, how can you establish right relationship with, with the immensity of the universe? Krishnaji, two things come to my <coughs> mind. One is, in looking at the outer, you are saying the brain quickens. In, in looking at the outside, in hearing the outside, the brain quickens. Of course, it becomes more sensitive. And therefore it can look at the inner without distortion. Distortion, that's all. Yes, sir. But half the world, the West, has always treated the outer as very, very concrete, as something, you know, all their energies have moved outward. But that doesn't seem to have brought about the inward movement either. Yes, sir. So we come to a much more serious question, would you allow it? What? makes a man change. Right? Would you begin with that also? I am this. I am brutal. I am violent, angry, jealous, hating people, envious, and uncertain, confused, so I am that. Right? I am the result of 8,000 years or 50,000 years what, why have I not changed? That's the, one of the basic questions. Isn't that too early, sir? Mm-hmm. Huh? Isn't that too early to ask the question? The discussion. It is, it is early, <laughs> but... You have to come to it at some point. Yes, I've come to it. I've been through all this. And I've read some books and so on. And also I see my job, I've lost my appreciation or my touch with nature. So I begin, I look, but ultimately I must ask myself, why is it humanity, why is humanity, I, a human being like the rest of the world, with all the turmoil and confusion and all the rest of it, why have I not radically changed? That's my question. But it's interesting that the ordinary man... You, I... I just move, I'm moving into that. Is much more concerned with gaining the object of his greed 
or running away from the object of his fear, then asking the question, why am I greedy or why am I afraid? What's your question, sir? What's the question? No, I'm just... No, but what is I'll the... answer the question. So, this question which you have raised, you raised your question, you said, why have I not changed? Well, ask yourself, sir. Ask yourself if I'm, I'm not being personal or disrespectful or impudent. Ask yourself why after 40 years or 30 years, why you are exactly as you were a few years ago, modified. There has been no radical change. Why? I would suggest any rational, any thoughtful person would ask this question. Change not, you understand what I mean by change? Not, not drop Hinduism and I accept Buddhism, or drop Buddhism and that's the same pattern being repeated over and over and over again. I don't mean that. Yes, but we, so we don't see it as the same pattern. We see it's a different pattern. No. Sir, I am, one is envious. That's a common factor for everybody. And it has produced a great deal of trouble in the world. Division, class division, <coughs> scholastic division, religious division, and so on, so on. And envy, we're still envious. Now, if I perceive myself being envious and seeing the consequences of envy, why is it I don't radically wipe it out of my brain? Don't make it complex. What's the brain? Who is I? Just wipe it out. Why is it not possible? Why haven't we done it? We talk about it endlessly. Sir, there is the, with most people today, there's this kind of a scientific outlook which deals with the outer. Obviously you are not implying that, that alone, because the mere scientific outlook seems to go somewhere else not bring about the relationship between the outer and the inner. And especially after education, one gets caught in this. And the other thing is, which seems to be a kind of a paradox, suffering seems to be necessary in some way. And still, when you suffer and you keep on suffering, it blunts you. What is the approach when one is caught in these two modes? An average human being is caught in these two modes. Yes, sir. First of all, there is no division between the outer and the inner. They are one. Would you agree? Would, do you see that? Not agree. Do you see that fact? The outer, the society in which we live. We have created that society. So I'm part of that society. The society is not different from me. That is one of the most fundamental facts. Would you, would you, see, do you recognize that fact? That's one thing. Secondly, why is there this division between people? Because there is division between you, me, and the, you belong to one group or one community or one religion, I belong to another, and so on, this division is created by thought. So it gets tremendously complex. Right? 
At the end of it all, you say, now I suffer. You suffer, the rest of humanity suffers, and one never says, can this suffering end? So would you say the two questions, can suffering end, and the question, why do I, have I not changed, are the same kind of questions? It is. It is the same question. Same question. And is it, is it, is the answer to both that we don't have enough energy? I wouldn't say you haven't got enough energy. One has plenty of energy when one wants to do something. Right? When you want to have money, I walk like, I walk tremendously to get that. So I don't think it's a matter of energy. Is it that we do not want to change with our whole being? Is Why is that a desire not to suffer, a desire to change, so easily dissipated in us? Is there no profit in that? We are profit motivated, right? We want a reward. So we are mixed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We want, we are, we, th we are, our brain is conditioned to reward and punishment, right? And I will walk like blazes if I can have a reward at the end of it. Money, position, status, whatever it is, happiness. Krishnati, which in itself is a process of time. <clears throat> I don't want to enter into time no, yet, sir. Just see the fact. Sir, I wanted to, I think we've moved away slightly. We were talking of the senses and their operation and yes, nature. Yes. Now, the senses are energy. That which is outside growing is energy. Tremendous energy. Have you seen a bed of grass growing the cement? Yes. Now, what is it that thwarts the energy of the senses? There is a thwarting of the energy of the senses, which uh, comes in the way of their really bursting. Is it our conditioning? Is it our education? And we were told to control. Yeah, I, 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 there must be some seed there, which leads us to be very careful and to channel ourselves. The whole of life and the whole of education yes. is a channeling of the senses. And perhaps that in itself is an incorrect approach. Yes. Because they, uh, uh, what is necessary is a conservation of energy. How does one conserve energy? How does one create... Would you, energy? now just a minute, Pupulji, would you conserve energy? Or the more you expand energy, the more there is. No, but you can also let energy ah. fit away. That just it. You see, for for a person like K, there is no distraction or attraction. There is no distraction. I don't know. This is this is the this is the magical thing, if you come to see. There's no distraction in the human mind, no triviality, no distraction. Also, no preoccupation. No, You're preoccupied with something. No, but you see this. You've that's seen right. This. That's right. Also, in the very. Saying, I will conserve energy. No, it is it, analyzing energy. No, I, I, it is said with a different viewpoint. It is said that 
we see that energy disperses. Whatever energy a human being has, he is dispersing it all the time. It is nothing. There must be something at the root of it. No, Prabhupada, you just look. I am conditioned from childhood on this idea of reward and punishment. Right? Mother and father say, Prabhupada, this I'll give you a sweet. <laughs> if you don't do that, I'll punish you. You enter the school, it's the same principle is carried out. More better marks, better examination, you follow? Our brain is conditioned to reward and punishment. Right? So, I expend all my energy to avoid punishment and to gain a reward. Yes. Right? Yes. That reward gives me energy. Yes, of a different quality. Wait, wait, that, wait, wait, that reward gives me tremendous energy to work, work, work. Yes. And you come along and tell me, This reward and punishment is a conditioning. In that there is no freedom. Right? In that there is um, heaven isn't a reward. Enlightenment isn't a reward. So but I have been trained from childhood to seek reward. So there is a battle. And I waste my energy in that battle. I don't. I want happiness. I want peace. And I do everything to to accelerate that. Sir, life is so complex. But if I try and solve that, I'll never solve it. But you have said, given a key. The key is this total operation of the senses. Yes. You see, because if I try and get caught no, in no, that complexity... No, no, don't, don't. I understand that. I'm, so the key is this total operation of the senses. Can we explore and go into that? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> because that wipes out. It, you, there's nothing to be done. Is seeing, perceiving, which is saying, and hearing. Are they separate or are they one? You understand my question? We think in. No. You see, when you. Now, wait a minute. When you hear this statement or this question, are they separate, the seeing and the hearing? And you begin to think about it, right? But you are not listening to the question the moment you think about it. No, I understand that. That right? I understand. Yeah. Now, will you? See, perceive, and hear at the same time. Not two separate things. Now, just a minute. I was talking to a scientist last year. He's a biologist and concerned with nature and so on. He asked me, Do you hear the sound of a tree? Not when the tree is in movement with the wind, when the tree is quiet, absolutely quiet, early morning when there is no breeze, or in the lake as the sun is setting without any breeze, without any wind. The, the tree has a peculiar quality of a sound. 
And I said, yes, it has this peculiar quality of sound. Now, do you hear that sound and see it at the same time? You follow what I'm asking? Or are they divided? This is, I don't want to go into more, if I may, if one may point out, it's not worthwhile going much deeper into the question of sound. Sound is an extraordinary thing by itself, because music is sound, and so on, so on, so I don't want to go into it. But can we see something without division? That's all I'm seeing. See, hear, feel, smell, taste. It's as though you're completely involved in it. Sir, you have frequently said that meditation, I'm asking in this context, that meditation is a sixth sense or a seventh sense. If you don't have it, you are missing a lot. What exactly is meditation for you, the essential nature of meditation? The essential nature of meditation is never to be conscious that you are meditating. If you attempt, say, I'll meditate, sit in a certain posture, sit quite quietly, breathe, and all the rest of this tricks you play, then it's like any other business. Business says you must do this, this, in order to get money. They want to achieve. Meditation is not an achievement. If you meditate according to your system, method, and so on, it is an achievement. At the end of it, you are at last, I've got peace. <laughs> As at last you say, I've got a million dollars in the bank. So meditation to K is something that cannot be consciously achieved. But this goes quite contrary to everybody. Is it separate yes. from um, the state of seeing, listening? Is it self-meditation? When, when you say in contact with nature, there seems to be uh, meditation going on in a, in a very sensitive way when there is a contact with nature, the kind you describe. And for oh, many sir. people, however intelligent they may be, posture uh, and an approach is uh, very relevant to meditation. I know. I know. And that. if you talk about meditation, eliminating all these things, one is lost. There must be be lost. Not the kind you mentioned. I'm be lost, be lost. Lost in confusion. Lost, no. When you are doing all this, that is confusion. <laughs> I don't know if what I'm saying is relevant. I so think... How would you further guide or point out so that meditation becomes an actuality. I don't know what you mean by meditation and actuality. Sorry, no, I'm not being facetious, but I really don't know what you mean by those two words. What is actual? This microphone in front of you is actual. You can touch it, you can feel it, mm -hmm. perhaps its own smell, oil, and all the rest of it. That's an actuality. And you might have an illusion and say that's an actuality. Yeah. But it's not actual. 
you have invented, you have escaped and created, all the rest of it. And what do you mean by the word meditation? We are, we are going off perhaps from what people is asking. Yeah, I, I, I really ask that question in relation with the full operation of the senses. There's one which you, the quality is very different from the scientific technological attitude. Because the scientific, the scientist and the technologist is concerned with the outer, but it is it's of different quality. You yeah, know, sir, they're also asking, as I told you the other day, we were invited to Los Alamos, where they are creating all kinds of atom bombs and so on, also investigating into cancer, into mathematics, into all kinds of things, the National Laboratory of America. Their concern was not only meditation, what is creativity in science? You follow? Yes. They are going beyond merely say, technological approach to life. There can be no other ground of the creative but the operation of the senses and it, the operation of the senses are themselves the ground of the creative. Which is, look, may I use a word without going away from the main subject. I'm rather shy of using that word, but let's use that word. When you are watching this whole universe, watching, not seeking any reward or punishment, just watching all this, watching the suffering of those villagers, those little boys walking, 12 miles a day to the school. You're watching all this. In that watching, there's great affection, love, care. So watching is not merely the senses only, but in that watching there is this quality of love. What awakens, because uh, I, I, I'm speaking for myself, I think there is a possibility for observing with all the senses that I've created. See, the awakening of all the senses mm -hmm. and the fullness of it. Yes. Yes. There's a quality of something totally different. Now, this is uh, what I want to come to. The, there must be something missing, because that explosion of the heart, let me put it in another word, <laughs> which, will, which will also... Uh, does That's not, a good phrase, explosion of the heart, right? does not happen, sir. I mean, I can say yes, the other, I know. But the expl explosion of the heart does not take place. That's really the crux. I'll tell you. Would you say the brain is the center of all our nervous electrical responses? Is the center of all thought? is the center of all confusion, yes. pain, sorrow, anxiety, depression, aspiration, uh, achievement, reward. It's a, it is a tremendous, uh, it, is, it is a great activity of confusion, contradictions. Love is not that. Yes. Therefore, it must be something outside the brain. Logically, just follow it logically. 
And we look at nature or other human beings from inside the brain. Inside the brain. I was walk, we were walking yesterday with some some other people here, and there was complete silence. Even the bullock cars, children, cycling, nothing existed. Just immense silence. Right? And it was not silence out there, it was silence, the entire world was silent. And you were silent. And you felt the whole earth as part of you, love, and all that. Now this is, you see... Now you see, sir, I don't, I, I mean, this is your statement and I'll listen Of to course, it may be again. silly nonsense. No, no. But the fact is, I do not wipe the tear of another. No. And uh, 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 therefore, the senses working simultaneously gives the brain great clarity, great a living, um, germinating, creative even in, in with goats ground, but it doesn't wipe the tear of another. No. So I am concerned with what is it that wipes the tear of another, because unless that quality enters... Not social activity, not going no, to the village no, and no. wiping tears. I mean, that you can do, but um, yes. it's necessary to do So that. just wait. Can the brain, that's my question, can the brain be so quiet so that it has the activity of thought has completely ended at that second or at that period. Or is it always chattering away? Is it, sir, that the only thing which it legitimate is to be totally awake. Totally, totally. To be totally awake to, for the senses to be. Yes, totally. And then never even query the other. No, of course, of course. You, you don't even know about it. How can you question what about is it? outside the skull? All I know is now what is within the skull. Right? And you come along and say that is. As long as you are in there, you will solve nothing. You point that out to me, and I listen to you. Because I see the logic of all this, the common sense of all this, and I see you quite right. So I'm, I want to know what it is to make the brain quiet. Though it has its own rhythm and its own, all the rest of it. What will make it quiet? We have tried everything, right? Fasting, not talking, uh, taking vows, celebrating. We have done everything. But the brain has never become quiet. Meditation is not quietness, right? You try to bring quietness to the mind through control, through all kinds of tricks. But that's not the stillness and the beauty of silence. So where do we end up? You see, it's a, everything else is man-made. Only that is divinity. And we just don't know to touch it. That is why this, you can take senses right to the end. 
I met a man the other day, one met the other man the other day, he was a great painter, well known and all that sort. He said, what man has made is the most beautiful thing. That was the end of it for him. And I pointed to what was that little tree. You haven't made it. I began to say some very interesting question. Yes, I'm